Those balls. <laughs> Welcome to it's it's Saturday. Saturday. You sound like uh, Bane Hartel from coming Batman. to you live from the from the subarctic. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> that lasted two okay. seconds. <laughs> well, it's just me here, and also I can't even hear me talking through the thing. So I'm gonna have to wear my. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to wear my uh, uh, hearing aids. And yes, where are you coming to us from, Michael? I'm coming from Henderson, and I would like to say today's podcast is supported by Henry Weihart's Black Cherry. Very delicious. Oops, which way? Shit, I do not want to do. God dang it. Uh, there we go. <laughs> but anyway, I thought, you know, what the hell? Let's go ahead and explain what our beverage of choice is. Yours is probably normal black <clears throat> coffee, like every military person ever. <laughs> it it uh, it almost is. I have gone with. Uh, I'd like to show it to the camera. Well, let me dip the camera down. That looks like going a, blonde. Going blonde. A yes, blonde uh, coffee. It's a. Indeed, indeed. It's uh, uh, peppermint mocha. <laughs> All right, Vinny, I see you there. I called you. I tried to call you like a week and a half ago, maybe, sort of, and uh, might have been on a weekend, too. So you didn't pick up, which is fine. I understood because we got late, but I'm like, holy crap, we've been trying <laughs> to see how you are for six to eight weeks. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> six to eight weeks. So anyway, we will continue to try to catch up because I really did. There you go. That's that's the way to go. Somebody tell them on a podcast. I really want to talk to you, and then never talk to them. There we go. And then and then no, I never follow up. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we, yeah. We don't. Actually, I did try. We don't watch our own podcast. <laughs> yeah. Which we call it. We call it a podcast, but actually, this is just a live stream video thing. Podcast is the the audio portion that you funnel through like iTunes or something, and we don't do that. This is just uh, just us sharing some words and some thoughts, and uh, when. When uh, Michael called yesterday, he's like, hey, I don't have anything for tomorrow. And I'm like, tomorrow? Oh, yeah, that's Saturday. And he said, but, but one thing I'm seeing is the repetition of stuff that people mentioned like 40 years ago. So uh, I call it the, the publishing ebbs and flows, even though uh, it's a cyclical, well, cyclical. There are some uh, uh, traditional publishing didn't get to how they were or the, how they are just by happenstance that took a, a lot of intentionality and maybe some things tweaked and changed over times and, and uh, maybe they didn't flex to the new audience as much as they as they could have but uh, still a lot of the pitfalls that they experienced are coming right around and uh, and hitting indie publishers or they're in front of indie publishers but the good thing is we have shatskin we have some other good people who have uh, talked about that stuff so this show is mostly yours michael well, what I wanted to do is, and it kind of plays off the fact that I think that I see a lot of people both were afraid of COVID. And Craig, you you did a lot of shows day after day after day, trying to give people a sense of normalcy, trying to get them to at least feel a groove so that the fears of the unknown that was coming on would be there. And so whenever I was reading this article that Mike Bray gave me, I'm looking at it and I'm just like noticing that it's the same fears I heard in 2015, 2016. It's the same fears that were happening in 1982. <laughs> and, you know, we have completely new paradigms. And that particular fear that I was riffing off of was the fact that everybody is worried about new publishers coming in and messing it up for whoever's here. So, <laughs> $20 a month per person. It's, uh, what? I was done. I was like, can we just put No, we, we, no we put everyone on you, YouTube, but... Uh, uh podcast personally no i don't we don't i'm sure we could with minimal effort but i'm not going to do that so there you are <laughs> yes, minimal own. is too much so with yeah, that though, even a minimal effort I... is too much <laughs> yeah. and so you know i ask people what are the fears that they're feeling right now because i believe <clears> that pe those fears are probably congruent with everything we heard three years ago everything we heard 30 years ago and the question that I had that it proposed was if it was a fear in 1982 and the industry continued growing and it was a fear in 2016 and the industry continued growing and it's a fear in 2020 I would argue the industry is going to continue growing ergo let the fear go to the side where it can't hurt you because fears you know obviously there are a few of us where the fear motivates you 
not speaking to you directly, but for the rest of you who lose creativity, lose energy, lose drive, lose desire, your brain only thinks about the concerns, put it aside. It was there 40 years ago. We continued on. Imagine if you will, I mean, right now COVID has its own issues related to, we have 600,000, et cetera, et cetera. It's nothing like the Spanish flu. I mean, let's, let's be a little bit blunt about that one. So humanity is going to move forward. And from that, then we try to figure out what's going on individually for each one of us. But at the same time, overall, push those fears to the side because they're not going to let you and help you today and just to move on. That was my message. You know, to some people, it was beneficial to a couple of others, maybe perhaps not so much. And so that was what I was thinking. So what I wanted to talk about, Craig, was just some of the things that even you heard back in 2015, 2016, you know, like you can't publish too fast was a big one, (laughs) you know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, I think you dispelled that rumor right up front with uh, Bethany Ann, uh, the first four books that you personally edited and you made 10 grand at one point as you published these books. They were self-edited and and you did your own covers. Now, since then, uh, you've had an editor go through them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But even with uh, comments in the uh, uh, in your reviews saying, Yes, somebody should uh, should edit this, or hey, you need to have a proofreader look at it. It's still you sold a lot of copies because people love the story, and this is where it's like the story will now. You want to stack your deck? You want to have it where they don't have typos, where there's nothing to take them out of the story. But if you have a great story, and this is the foundation of of, of your business as a self-published author, if you can hit that foundation and build that strong foundation of a great story, then your product is viable. And this is, you find the readers of that genre and you can exploit it and, and get there. And for those folks who said, oh man, you can't get urban fantasies already slammed, uh, this slammed, you can't cross genres, you can't, 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 all kinds of can'ts, you suck, you won't, you don't, uh, <laughs> you're not day. one of us. <laughs> it's a day ending with and, why. You know, yeah, it's a day ending with why, so you're not going to be successful, you you suck. Uh, and uh, so, and that was, uh, that was the forum, that was the, the forum to go for self-published authors. And there was so good, so much goddamn negativity there. It's like, fuck, man, I just crawl in a hole. <laughs> and it's like, uh, and Mike Michael Anderley said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to crawl in a hole. I'm not going to stay here and denigrate your platform. I'm going to go start my own. And 20 books to 50K. So he started a Facebook group with four people. Hey, because, hey, we're going we're gonna to talk about things we're doing our way and see if we can do them a little bit better and uh, see how we can ethically and 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 uh, responsibly move forward with these businesses because I see potential, and that is a huge difference uh, in Michael Anderley between Michael Anderley and some of the other folks out there is sees the potential, sees what can be, and uh, I have that same same mindset in that I see what can be and not uh, hey let me criticize you. Uh, there's no value in me criticizing you. There's value in me criticizing myself and and critiquing myself in order to get better, take input on stuff that matters. And you look back and the books that Mike made me buy, I mean, uh, or asked that I uh, suggested that I should read, um, they went to that with, with traditional publishing. Literature. And why the... the in cold type, uh, you're not specifying get, what I made you buy. <laughs> no, and there were a couple of them. There's one by uh, what... Michael Mike Shatskin? is the son. Yeah, Mike Shatskin is the son. Okay. And his dad in cold type, Leonard Shatskin. So it's more like if you want to understand the last 10 years, go to Mike Shatskin. He has books related to things mm-hmm. he's put on his blog. If you want to understand the concepts of the industry, go to his dad, Leonard Shatskin, in cold type is the name of the book. And and ones you saw with how they built with the with the acquisition editor and how they narrowed what they accepted into what they knew the readership would buy in order to send these copies out. We're going to send out 100,000 copies. We know 90,000 are going to sell because that's what our people buy. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, they, they explored the, the, the frontiers and then the boundaries. Could they push it? Would people buy three books a month or were only going to buy two books a month? And looking at these revenue streams, 
uh, they liked a consistent revenue stream and they liked expanding, but it was like, hey, encourage, encourage Barnes and Noble to expand, not that we're going to expand our offerings in such a way that we're bringing on all these new authors because that wasn't the uh, model. They had a model set on here's how many people we can we can reasonably publish a year. And that was another thing where Michael Anderley saw opportunity in that, well, our people read more than one book a month. That's the trad pub model is to exploit those uh, those readers who will buy one book a month or maybe even only two books a year. And so that's their model. But if you look at a model that suggests that people might read 20 books a month, how do you satisfy those readers and and get them on board the train and read your stuff? Okay, so this is things. this is the opportunity. Two things. Yeah. Craig, you're the one who was cussing. So when Elaine's saying in there that mother-in-laws, you know, are hurt with their ears. I just want to say that you did that, not me. I'm not sure what number two was. <laughs> oh, 20 books. It's not 20 books a month. 20 books to 50K is 20 books written and released in a year. <laughs> just because people, I, and it's like, now I'm getting 50 books to 20K. And I get all these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and 20 books to 50K, it's 20 books that have been published, not that you have to publish yeah, them in true. one year or publish 20 books every year. It's it's these twenty books. If you're earning seven fifty a day, that will earn you about fifty thousand a year. Yeah, there's and that's a year. and that's <laughs> that's 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 it's a retirement plan. So <laughs> that that's all it is, and and it uh, it's a uh, kind of uh, the way you earn money. You get that first release, you make more on it, and then it tapers down. And it's uh, it's uh, there, there's a lot of more more calculated ways, but still, that's the premise is that yeah. your old work has value, your new work has value because it pushes your old work, and then it all works together to provide you a retirement a, a retirement fund. If you do it well and, and you stay engaged with it, I mean, there's all kinds of caveats, but it, it works. It works to have the mindset that this can be, my words have value that can support me and my family. And I think that's the biggest win out of, out of all of this. And uh, uh, my apologies to your mother-in-law, uh, but now she's uh, she's wiser in the ways of the world. Did we freeze up? Did we lose Michael? Did, did we lose me? That's the big question. Yes, we lost you. <laughs> okay. You know, we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago, but with something that you just said right there was criticism. And the only person to criticize is yourself. And, it's, and it can, you can be as loving or as hateful in your criticism. I, su I suggest loving and supportive over, you know, but you should know you well enough. But I really like how you said that because at the end of the day, don't spend your time criticizing others because that's just a lazy attitude to get off the fact that you need to be working on something. You know, talk to yourself, explain to yourself, look at yourself. That's how you can get better because the learning is out there whether it's in 20 books to 50K or it's in a book somewhere on Amazon or it's in another group, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> I think you might be losing me again. Oh, you're, you're amazing. So just to let you know that. And you're there. And, 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 and addressing a couple of uh, comments, uh, yes, please, that would be easier on YouTube. We put every episode on YouTube. Look for the 20 Books to 50K channel, and you'll find uh, hundreds, probably a, almost a couple hundred videos in there. So uh, there you go, YouTube. It, it's easy. Um, 50K and profit. Well, the 50K, the profit needed was 35K. That was what you needed for the 50K Avenue, 35K. Because that's what Michael came up with. Uh, if you uh, have thirty-five thousand dollars, is three thousand thirty-six thousand in Mexico? Yeah, three thousand in Mexico. You, you can, have to bring in outside of an American. You know, you can't work in Mexico and make thirty-six. So if you wanted to be an American in Mexico, you had to bring in three thousand a month, and that's where you know. But to your point, Craig, I can't believe I forgot my own freaking thing. But seven and a half dollars, twenty books, makes fifty-four. Easier to round it off to fifty k. So 20 books, and that allowed me to retire my wife, and we could live in Cabo on that money, taking the money we had in a house in Texas and moving it down into Mexico. So, 
By the way, that particular house has been pushed back again, so it's not de delivered in July. COVID, thank you very much. But somehow or another, a house that should have been three months from being done is now significantly longer. <laughs> so, yep, hold it. Well, it's not like we can get to Cabo right now, anyway. Uh, as soon as it opens up, we'll be there. We'll be there in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There we go. What? What? <clears throat> Elaine Bateman. There's a YouTube channel, and it doesn't say twenty books of fifty k. Named U capital U capital C capital T R Q M. Come on, Craig, get a name. <laughs> I don't know. I I didn't I didn't make that. That seems very complex. <laughs> so related to publishing ebbs and flows, you know what I wanted to kind of mention is the fact that if you're thinking about anything others are saying where they're worrying about things, publishing has had these same issues for many 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 decades. The only genre that I've seen so far that went away was westerns western dropped out of the top four because when you went from the major um the major type of production to the next one let's say from hardback to paperback paperback to the pockets and and just moving forward how they did things it westerns was one of the top four until the last major time that it happened i think maybe 70s 80s or something you know you know book clubs all of them were working at romance they looked at mysteries thrillers and then they had something. And so I think sci-fi, urban fantasy took over Westerns. Not that Westerns aren't popular. Mike Bray, if you're paying attention to this, we love you very much. But Westerns dropped out of the top four. So Well, Westerns kind of capped. It's it's uh, They could not expand the boundaries of that audience any further. Mm -hmm. And especially as the older folks. I mean, my dad would read rest Westerns. My dad would read Don Pendleton. My dad would read uh, the, uh, 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 the various series, older thriller authors like Harold Robbins. I'll tell him that uh, Mike Bray has released, started releasing Harold Robbins uh, old books and uh, those kinds of things. So that demographic of readership has gone and it wasn't replaced with the younger, younger uh, folks. So that's, even though their cowboy romance is, is a huge, huge industry and growing, but Westerns as a genre are, I think they're fairly well tapped. Now, you know new, who, uh, new books are still doing fine, exploiting the current demographic readership, but expanding it is where there's the challenge. You know who you can blame for this? Uh, we, we, the, the great pop culture reference movie called Toys shows exactly who is responsible for Westerns getting pushed aside. Buzz Lightyear and his cohorts are responsible for all of that problem yeah i've noticed for defeating the, the woody yeah <clears throat> damn it <laughs> so, you totally derailed my thought on buzz the, over uh, woody every time <laughs> people you'll have oh, no my, idea I'm sorry. what i go through <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I had such a good, it was probably going to make people money. And then thanks, Craig, totally derailed that thought. <laughs> oh, so this is something that I've noticed going around the world. Um, Judith and I'll go to like bookstores and stuff and trying to see, this is specifically for science fiction and urban fantasy. Well, more sci-fi. Those countries who have a strong um, space focused to their country, those have sci heart, larger sci-fi um, readerships than others. So if you go to a general populace, let's say Latin America, who hadn't been really pushing more from the the you know space efforts, then they don't have it. But if you go to China, and I bet it would be I would be willing to put money down that if you go and study science fiction based previous to the uh, revolution of really going after and moving, which is about, what, 30 years ago or something? And if you go back to China 30-ish years ago, it was predominantly bicycles and their major cities. And if you go now, their cities are, well, quite frankly, bigger and better than like Los Angeles and New York and a lot of those because they're newer for one. But, um, you know, they're using the latest technology and their science fiction, the size of their science fiction is significantly larger than the American science fiction. You know, just by and large. Of course, they have a billion people, that helps. But if you go to the countries that have sci-fi or have space as a component of their 
you know, country itself, you'll see a much larger sci-fi component. So it's just esoteric thoughts. <clears throat> one of the one of the things that uh, you know I don't like people who start sentences with "I heard." Uh, can you comment? Uh, why comment on a rumor? But there are a lot of people who are influenced by things that say uh, in publishing is saturated. That uh, there's too many publishers coming in. There's too many new authors. It's ruining everything. And uh, what prompted Michael's thoughts on publishing was the paper that or the book that Mike Gregg recommended was from 1982 and it's one of its main complaints was there are too many publishers coming into the industry and it's spoiling it because uh, yeah. I think if we tally up revenue from 82 till now uh, how many hundreds of billions of dollars have been injected into the uh, the publishing industry during that during the last 40 years yeah, it's, it's it's a little. It's more than a hundred. I think the, the last time I looked at it, the majors, the major trads. I think the industry itself is over five billion. That includes technical and you know, schooling, yeah. different things. But there's more than enough money. So the encouragement there is, yeah, highly unlikely to go away, because believe it or not, there are people who really don't like watching television, that would prefer to read a book. You know, that's me. Yep. And so when so everyone says that everything's going to go to YouTube, I enjoy a good YouTube from time to time, especially. But I find it a pain in the butt to go find the what I'd like, enjoy seeing versus. And that's Michael locking up because I have five bars because right now my Internet is awesome. <clears throat> the uh, I'll fill in. Um. Uh, books. It's you, Michael. It's not me, man. It's not me. You got sucky okay. internet in your new in 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 Henderson. Uh, I got five bars. The uh, I'm down to one bar now. So anyway, yeah. it's all you. <laughs> what happened, man? You had such good connection last week. So um, I can't see if there's anybody that's making any comments or questions or anything. So I don't know if we have anything. Um, yeah. Well, somebody says it's scary when a genre can drop out over that. Uh, Western's dropped over decades. Yeah. It just started trimming down. So it's not like it disappeared yesterday, like, say, harem or reverse harem. Oh, man, that's going gangbusters. And then it, no, no pun intended. And, and then uh, uh, like six months later, it's gone. Uh, I don't think anything comes in and goes that quickly. Trendy stuff can can come and go fairly fast, but a whole genre, no, that takes decades to wind down. People have made entire careers after Westerns had reached their peak, made their career, and then retired. So, no, goods, there's always room for good stories. Look at uh, uh, William Johnstone. He publishes a new book uh, with a William Johnstone title, and all of a sudden, hey, that's up there in the top 100, and Amazon stays there for a while, makes good money, and and, and it keeps moving on. It's you, The readership is there. You write a great story, people are going to read it. Uh, the readers are there. Uh, finding them may be harder because there's a lot more there's a lot more uh, uh, water around which the fish swim or within which the fish swim. So you're just trying to find that, but uh, you just – Get the right lure and, and cast until you do. Excellent. So, well, and another thing to mention is that um, it also the genre just changed. Westerns, as they were known, were cowboys back in the old west. Well, now westerns, if you yeah. really want to say, are contemporary westerns out on the farm, out on the ranch with a a Ram Charger or Ford, you know, F one fifty. Not quite the the same horse, but so these these things change. But anyway, I just I yeah. just wanted to take the opportunity, Craig, and talk to you about the fact that it seems to me that a lot of the worries about this industry, as far as I can tell, I mean, we obviously could be wrong, but as far as I can tell, have existed for decades, were there before, are here now. And if that's true, how much credence should we worry, should we give them versus recognizing that there's always going to be readers as a percentage of the world they might be slightly less but guess what there's also a hell of a lot more people <laughs> so slightly yeah. less percentage of more people is still an amazing amount of people 
So, so as you've as you've grown your uh, indie publishing brand, what are some pitfalls that you're seeing that TradPub recognize that you're now encountering that you're you're able, either able to sidestep or address better? The you know one of the things that has been on my mind recently has been pre-orders. You know, I started out as if if I had been finished the book on Monday, I wanted that thing released by Friday, and we built a whole company around that. And now we're starting to work with other companies who don't have that capability of turnaround. And some of them are predicated, especially audio companies, where they need six to 12 months. And so we're getting enough requests that we're starting to look further down the road and start create or conceptualize, implement, create these products that are going to be farther down. And so what does that do? And then you start looking even at... Um, uh, cash flow, you know, because if you're investing in trying to make something and then have to wait nine months to release it, it's a challenge, right? And so there, so there's a part of it, but the, one of the benefits of doing this, I'm finding out, is just pre-orders, being able to put something out. If you're all in on Amazon, you know, the pre-orders have gone out to a year now, and you have the ability and and hopefully, you know, encouraging people, let them know your book is there. Because that one day boost, when that release day hits and you have a 10,000 or 15 or whatever thousand, thousands of dollars a day, three, one, whatever it is, it, it's a really big boost. And remember, you get those orders on that day, right? But then the KU yep. roll forward. So consider that. And one of the things that, that we've mentioned in Edinburgh was if you release at the end of the month, then you get the money and it's only 60 ish days from when you actually put it in your pocket. And then you roll the KU effectively into the next month because it takes a little bit of time for the readers to ramp up on your KU and you move that to the next month. So if you're even close to getting a bonus, well, that's one way to try to acquire a bonus is giving the most days of the month when your biggest amount of KUs are going to happen. And that's for a so that's, that's for a big book, a book that's really popular. And you're talking, uh, I think, right now in the U.S., it looks to be at least five million page reads in a month on a single title in order to get into the bonus land. So, just understand, talking the numbers, something, but it's, uh, it's pretty massive. Um, it could have just been me. Do check into international. You know, um, do some advertising over in UK. Help promote that. Um, Germany has been very successful for us, more successful in translation than obviously English, but Germany was actually pretty good because they do learn English over there. Um, Australia, frankly, has been really good. So from a traditional mindset, it's global. You know, traditional mindset is that they're going to look over everything and then be aware of the different methodologies. Have you looked into book clubs? <clears throat> I don't know. You know, we'd like to. But the uh, the paperbacks and that there's there's so many issues with that. If you wanted to do an, a, a, a drive up your paperback sales, and that becomes a significant challenge if you're trying to do direct sales on paperbacks, because now you have what TradPub identified a long time ago is now you're you're building a logistics a supply chain, so you need to store them, you need to re receive them, store them, manage them, and then ship them out. So now you can see why oh TradPub. Why does TradPub only offer like a minimal percent on royalties for authors? And it's like, oh, they're pushing their hardbacks and their paperbacks, but they've got this monumental, monumentally massive overhead based on this model of I have to store 10,000 books and then we'll ship them out incrementally. So now you got the people picking and choosing, adding a couple other books. And and, and uh, so now you've got manpower. It costs time. It, it's, uh, it, it is a significant effort. If you could just do dropship with a POD, Hey, easy day, POD print on demand. That's 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 the easy way. So Amazon's going to send me a buck on a book that I'm charging 10 bucks for. Hey, good on them because I don't have to touch any of it. Uh, thank goodness. And this is something Amazon revolutionized. Uh, that previously, you had to offset print and get pallets of books and then ship them out. And that uh, that is uh, that just it costs money. So there are certain things that that have a a significant upfront cost. So there's a couple of things to add to that as well. 
POD, if you go back and look in the history of Amazon and, and how Jeff Bezos understood what was going on with the industry, find out just for shits and giggles, who was the partner he used? You probably know this, Craig. Who's the partner? I read, I read the book you made me read. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that was contractually, he got a contractual guarantee from Ingram to that if if he sent in an order on a book, three days, they would ship it. Ingram said, yes, we can do that. And he's like, you understand this number might be in the millions. And they're like, we're good. We can do this. We print books for a living. Because previously, Ingram did a vast a number of books. And since that sh that changed from pre pre-ordered pallets of books to just a, a, a POD model, they flexed with it, but they gave, they gave uh, Jeff Bezos that guarantee of time, we can get this done. So when he said we can ship within this time frame your book, uh, Ingram delivered and they helped make Amazon the bookseller of the world. Yeah, so if you go back to Ingram, Ingram implemented this strategy and you will find that Amazon will offload some of their excess effort back to Ingram even today. And then I put yep. something up in our internal Slack group where I mentioned for those uh, people who are out in Australia, if you've ever tried to ship from America to Australia, it's not only takes forever, it's got awful expensive. Well, Ingram is investing in building a, an additional POD delivery location and printer in Australia. So you become aware of some of these things that are going on. For the question that said, do, am I aware of how many new readers Amazon gets? I'm not, by the way. I can tell you that in Mexico, it wasn't terribly impressive. Um, but in others, you know, it's, it's slowly, it's slowly getting better. So you actually have to worry about like, which country are you going to do this in? Because Amazon's not necessarily in other countries all that well. So, you know what? I just now consider this when you in maybe Craig, you know, this, so I'll throw this out there. You know, that whenever you set up a book on Amazon and you're going to go into KU, is that KU only specific to the countries you've said you wanted to deliver your book to? And if so, does that mean that you, you know, and I know Canada, I think is just part of North America, <clears throat> but it, it is not, it's a single checkbox. Do I wish to participate in Kindle Unlimited program? You check the box and, and that's it. So now if you have a translation into German, that's a different edition and you can have your German edition of your book not in KU yes, because it's a different edition. So you can put it into Germany wide if it's in German, but your, your single English ebook, that is the single edition. There's one checkbox. Yes, I want to be in KU. And then, so you can't select your country. So if, if uh, Australia is only paying a point, a half of what America pays for a page read, that's I'll what you India. get. So <laughs> yeah, go to or, India. Or, India is the one that you get nothing for, but um one, anyway, one, I, one ruby a patron. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, the first time that I saw I got some money from Japan, I was all excited. Look at this. Look at. Oh, wow. That's basically thousands know. of dollars. No, 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 no. That's thousands of yen. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yen is about a penny or something, at least at the time. So anyway, that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah. So so we move forward. Uh, what's the book Michael made you? Oh, the book I, ma I Leonard made. Leonard Chatskin. Yeah, Leonard Shatskin's in cold type, and Craig is so full of crap. It, um, I did not make him do this. I suggested he is like, man, this is a really excellent book. I know Craig loves business. Craig, that's what you know. He's a business consultant, so to to say that I made him read this, it's kind of like you know. He, he followed I... up daily with questions. Hey, what, on page eight, what did you think of that? And then the you next know, day, I'd be I like, oh, man, I did, did, did I you did. Do that? You did I... for like weeks, weeks afterward as you it were reading it and digesting it. Wanted, well, you wanted to talk about it. So I was your personal book club of one. So I felt <laughs> obligated to. Uh, so, so I felt obligated to finally read it. And I'm like, hey, this is interesting stuff. And and out of out of one of Leonard Shatskin and, and Michael Shatskin's book, the, the, the newer version, uh, yeah. one thing that I saw in there was. I, that I think they're going to be wrong about was their slavish adherence to ISBNs. I think Amazon is doing everything humanly possible to to uh, eliminate the ISBN system for identifying books. 
because that's the old ordering system that was required and you had to do it. I mean, it's the only way a, a library could find your book. But there's since there's newer ways now, I mean, the Internet's a whole lot different and databases are a whole lot different. We don't need that ISBN. And, and uh, I, I think that will eventually go away, even though I personally bought 100 ISBNs and I'm slapping them on my titles. Uh, it's uh, still I think that will eventually go away and that uh, they'll be they'll be irrelevant because Leonard Chaskin in his book, most recent book, he's like, you have this right. is one critical element. You must you must have your uh, ISBNs squared away. Yeah, you must be talking about his son, Mike. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> the one that's alive. The younger. Yeah, yeah. The one that... <laughs> let's not categorize people. Come on. Let's not shove them into boxes. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, um, one of our – who is it? I'm not sure which – one of our contacts knows Mike Shatskin, and he's, he's out in the, uh, in the New York area. And so I was thinking that if I went to BEA this year, I'd, I'd try to get out a chance to meet him. I really do find a lot of his stuff. Now, Mike Shatskin and, and um, Hugh Howie – spent a lot of time talking and debating with each other back in the early 2010s, 11, 12, 13, 14 timeframe. Uh, and it's in some of his books, you know, the things that they talked about and disagreed with and everything. So I think that it would be really intriguing to talk to someone who was there before me and learn kind of what was going on related to, <clears throat> to that. And, and this is this is about managing your business, and that's uh, from a business model perspective. Because Michael looked at uh, a book club and physical sales, and we spent a lot of time. Michael spent an incredible amount of time and effort looking at how can we manage like a book club, doing physical sales, uh, re expecting the sales force, incentivizing the readers to uh, help sell books, and uh, it, it was. So it almost fell in the too hard category, but those these are kind of the lessons that we learn. And, and as a business consultant, I would always say uh, uh, you leverage your strength. And the strength for uh, for LMBPN is eBooks. This is the whale readers. It's Kindle Unlimited because of the pages and the page reads for books. Uh, it uh, it's what the company was founded on that quick delivery, and since then. What, what Michael has done is compress the time frame between when a book's finished until the book is published. And even with a, a pre-order, it's still right now, it's like for a newer book, it's three weeks from when the book is finished, finished by the author until it actually goes, uh, hits the street because brought all those elements together that TradPub kept kind of separate, but I, I on my one TradPub title, I finished a book and I'm like, hey, I'm delivering it six weeks early. She's like, it doesn't matter. You're on the schedule for three months from now to get edited. I'm like, you, you got to be kidding me, right? It, it's done. It's uh, ready six months, six weeks early. Oh, good on you. I'm going to edit in three weeks, in three months. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, that's uh, really how it happened. And that's, they didn't edit it for three months. So uh, <laughs> because I'm looking at, hey, I'll get this out there. We're going to sell it. I'm going to make money. You're going to send me money. And a couple of years down the road, life is good. No, we're not going to edit it for three months. And then we'll publish it three months after that. So and this is one thing that uh, Michael and I both said, absolutely no way in hell we're going to do business this way. <laughs> and and here I am. Uh, I finished a book a month ago and uh, uh, I'm going to publish it at the end of November. <laughs> and the lessons learned. Is because I want to I want to publish I want to release audio at the same time and audio takes a long time and I'm gonna have the paperback the paperbacks already be out sent purchasable well before then probably about uh, uh, the beginning of October I'm thinking the uh, paperbacks will be available simply because included some rush lyrics and I uh, sent that request for licensing and we'll see what I get back and what I can uh, what I, what I can put it in there so that was a four to six week time frame which isn't bad considering this is rush right greatest band of all time and they're gonna and i'm asking to license some lyrics so, so all of these things take time and with the paperbacks once those are out i'm like hey let me send them out to a few readers i know i'm not the art guy yeah, but i'm gonna send them out to a few folks a few high uh, heavy hitters in the thriller uh and espionage and uh, uh vigilante justice genres and say hey, hey could you uh could you uh, give it a read and, and, and give me some loving? Uh, and if they don't, no problem. They get a book out of it. And if they do, great. Uh, uh, hope it works. But that takes time. So November 30th, here I am. 
oh man, I finished a book and I'm going to sit on it for three fucking months. <laughs> maturity, Craig, maturity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Oh, and I finished I, I, I finished a book two days ago for you, for, uh, for us uh, in the Cartharian Gambit universe. And uh, people are like, oh, okay, cool. When are you going to, are you going to publish this week? I'm like, actually, no, it's uh, uh, September. <laughs> so it's almost a month. But uh, it, it's uh, because of pre-order, because of uh, sales. We're going to run a big sale on uh, books one to nine in that series. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And to get those paid promotions in, it takes time. So I'm like, oh, my God, Tradpub. It, it, it's it's, oh, it's oh, unbecoming oh, Tradpub. Uh, no, no, no. Stop that. <laughs> You, you're very weird. okay, people. He is giving just so much shit right now. <laughs> the, it is you, you delivered it August fourteenth. We have a two yeah there you go a two week editing. So the whole editing that you was interesting you brought that up because in a brand new series we do put three weeks because one week of beta reading in order for beta readers to go through and see if we have story issues and if so we toss it back. But in general anything Craig is is two weeks and arguably. He already has an in with the editor. She would turn around and make almost anything done in time for him. But Craig didn't stick anything on the damn schedule, so we couldn't actually put anything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Give me that. You, you. So, yeah. You, you, you. For the people. Yes, he's over here going. Oh, not me. Not possibly me. Yes, you. Now everyone should remember that Craig A knows Russian. B, and that's important. B, he's been taught by the best military in the freaking world to go and, and handle communications and subvert communications and manipulate communications. There is a hierarchy of people who know how to lie. I thought statisticians were at the top of that heap. I have now placed military communication specialists above statisticians because of knowing Craig Martel. The ability to bullshit his way through anything has yet to be so anyway, that's what he is. Serves my fiction stuff. well. Serves my fiction well. <laughs> <laughs> and the, to the question, the higher volume of book releases that you two have had, have you discovered there's a better time of year to execute those no book releases? The only ones that I would say offhand, I, and this is just from a general sales, has been August, has almost always been really great for us. June, usually not so much because before COVID, Trad Pub would put a lot of books out during June. Everyone would go to the beach. They'd read their favorite, you know, their James Patterson or whatever. Um, August has always been released in July, for that matter, has been solid. The week after Christmas, Christmas to New Year's has been incredibly good, strong for us. The same thing now, it looks like going into January has been strong. Um, I wouldn't necessarily plan on anything because in, in my career, both as an author and a publisher, we pretty much ignore those occasionally to our peril, but with enough effort, anything can become a good release cycle. So uh, I don't, it, I do it, ignore them. It, it all depends on the foundation and Michael Anderley's LMBPN foundation is fairly solid in that he knows he's going to get X number of sales on a certain series uh, before he releases that next book. So that helps and then that also desensitizes the time based on your demographics if you're if you're uh, looking to target uh, uh parents of teenage girls well when are the teenage girls less demanding of those parents time and these are the things you have to take into account if you're publishing randomly throughout the year but if your demographic is retirees which that's mine that's michael's then uh, any time of the year is a good time if they know the book's coming out and this is sometimes say Thanksgiving. Hey, they travel to visit the grandkids. Grandkids come to their house. So Thanksgiving Day, day after Thanksgiving, they're out shopping with the and so those it, it's it's no understand your target demographic and and serve them properly, build that reader uh, that reader list. And this is something Michael uh, recommended a year ago to me because I said, hey, I'm thinking about the uh, Amazon Marketing Group and thirty thousand dollars for a one month focused effort on one book. It was big. And he's like, big. what if you take, he's, he's like, what if you take that 30 grand and use it to expand your readership? <clears throat> and right now, uh, and, and I finally started doing that over the last month, I've been working a, a very specific ad on Facebook targeting readers that like my stuff. And I'm getting new readers <clears throat> into my pipeline and through the pipeline at about 36 cents each. So $30,000 times 36 cents each, 
uh, you can see what kind of uh, uh, numbers are 36, 30,000 divided by 36 cents equals a number of readers like 80, 000, that I could potentially have my, my list. It's a big, big number. So yeah. this is, uh, yeah, imagine if you increased your newsletter to 85,000 people who clicked and have already gone through your your uh, onboarding sequence. So they know, hey, here's your, here's your writing style. Here's what you have. You're an author. Yes, you're going to try to sell me stuff. But uh, I, I, I like the way you approach life, the world, and uh, entertainment. So this is, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. And I never did uh, get with the uh, Amazon marketing group on that 30 grand, but I've tagged it and set it aside and, and uh, adding a lot of new readers into my pipeline, into my newsletter. And they're very, very specific, focused, targeted. So this is a lesson from the past. And that past was only a year ago when I was looking for that uh, magic bullet. And you know what? You don't get a magic bullet. This is a business where you build it. Uh, you have to build it slowly and then they will come. Some people may get lucky with that first book and the first book is a runaway winner. Uh, Michael's first book, uh, the first month, uh, he made a good uh, a good <laughs> hundred bucks or something. Three, three, three but, books released, 330, like seven or eight net dollars. <laughs> you killed it, man. You freaking <laughs> killed it. Yep. Day number three, I made 99 cents or 97 cents or something like that. It was amazing. Very edifying. I three to 300 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Michael, Michael's new mantra, three books to 300 bucks. And you got to release them fast. <laughs> yeah, book four, we crossed 3000 and in the third month we hit uh, ten, five books and 10,000. So, and that's, and that is another great lesson for now. Cause I think one of the tra traditional publishing lessons is, you will monetize the book. You will make the majority of your money back off the book in the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. And what, what Michael has shown and what I've seen myself is that's not true. I've made much more on my free trader series in the last year than I did with the first three years that it was published because uh, better marketing, the complete set omnibus edition, I was making more in a month than I made in a year with that full set when they were individual books because of that, uh, that complete set Omni. And I, it rolled big numbers for an awful long time and is still rolling good numbers. And uh, this is currently, I'm not marketing because I, I was trying to rewicker the ads and we haven't gotten anything started yet and might have uh, one going right now, but the, uh, your words have value and they can have value for a long time if it's a good story. And uh, yeah, you get social proof with the reviews and stuff like that. Uh, but critique yourself. Is this, when you go back through it, it's like, okay, this is good enough. It tells the story. And is it a better investment of your time to go back and keep keep dicking with a, an old book? Or is it to write a new book and keep moving forward with your business, adding products to the shelves and adding good products to the shelves? It's okay to be, think of yourself as an art gallery and not Walmart. And if you're an art gallery, you have the pieces, you have some set out up front, you have some on the back walls, and this is what you're providing to your readers. You're not Walmart where you have try to have every kind of product of, uh, imaginable, and and that's how you're selling. Hey, I'm going to sell them for four bucks and I'll make 10 cents on it, but I want to sell thousands and hundreds of thousands of these things, the Walmart model. And you could say, well, Michael's publishing five books a week, but each author is publishing only so many and those authors all have their separate art gallery where they're like okay here i have these these things come and take a look so michael is the the Afizi of florence he has this huge museum and you go in these different rooms and you see these different art pieces in there and that's when you fall in love with michael the big I, michael when you can't reference who in history craig is talking about you know smoke is being blown somewhere <laughs> <laughs> it was the best i had man i it was coming to me i was on a roll uh, when the bomb yeah, when the germans apparently. bombed pearl harbor <laughs> so so um gosh damn it oh these things that i have and then you pulled this crap out um i'm sorry folks i really would like not to leave you hanging but craig once again this has been the worst particular call for me this time i you have just side railed me so many damn times um 
And I'm not used to this, Craig. I'm really not. <laughs> no, well, it's 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 not that uh, you got derailed. It's just that we were. It's like when you're writing a book and you say, "Well, I, I just I'm, I'm get going really slowly right now because you're not sure what's going to happen next." We weren't really ready for this call because yesterday you threw out a couple <laughs> things on on publishing I got it, I got and it. like okay. this, and also. Okay, stop, stop, stop for a minute because now I have it financing. You and I have spoken about this, and I've talked to a few other people about it. And um, I think you know Mark Dawson has mentioned some stuff related to it as well. But if you think about it, if you put uh, your, if you go to an Excel spreadsheet, and let's say you have a thousand dollars for advertising, and you get effectively one thousand five hundred dollars back for it, for the sake of argument, right? Then in order for you to get that extra five hundred dollars, both your your investment and your five hundred dollars back, you're going to have to wait. 90 days from the day that you start this effort fair or 60 days from the last day of the month that you're you started this effort so if you are willing to invest in this example three thousand dollars you do it a thousand dollars a month at the end of month three now you don't actually invest any more money into this model so provided that you can at least make 50 percent back on your money so at month four you've taken the thousand dollars that amazon has given you back of your first thousand that you did in this case, let's say January. And in April, you invest that thousand dollars. Now you also have $500 left over, right? So what do you do with that? That's up to you. Uh, you could put it back in and make it $1,500, which means you now locked that $1,500 back in. Month five comes to the end, which means you're getting the money back from month two, your thousand plus 500. And so from that perspective, you are uh, you, you become a financial institution Talking about backlist, this is where you, you reminded me of this situation, Craig, was your backlist. You and I spoke about the cost of your investment for the ads for your boxed set and the fact that you had to put nothing more into it but add money. So recognize that the next one of the next stages, and this is something that has been going around my mind for a few years, and I've spoken to a few people about it, you're now an investment agency. You're a financial company. You, your effort is basically putting money into something. Now, if you have to outsource your marketing, like we do, we actually pay lots of people. You know, you have a cost above and beyond just your advertising expense. But if it's just you, then the money, not in time, but your money is just going toward ads. And so you can, like, um, you know, Marky e. Cooper, I think, is one of the first people I know of. And I haven't ever spoken to him about this. Uh, I'd love to, but he's um, he's very introverted and uh, hard to get a hold of. I've tried, uh, <laughs> but you know he the the rumor is because I don't know personally that he was able to basically make a living off of advertising his books. And you know that's what you're talking about. That you're saying that your particular first series you wrote four years ago, based on advertising, is bring you back more income than before so so that portion of your business isn't author whatsoever you are a salesperson and you are taking a commission off of these sales that you craig martell other you is licensing so to speak you know just to make it yeah. very convoluted but you know that was the, the piece that i wanted to talk about is that when you look at it just think about it as a three-month commitment and then that you're having to bring money back in above and beyond to cover the extra expenses, whether it's a marketing person or uh, ad cost or, you know, the creation of the ad, the images, whatever it is. Or if you happen to be so lucky that you're actually for every dollar you invest, you make another dollar. Well, now it's a thousand in, two thousand out, but you got to wait. So you have a financing cost across that. So you, it's an interest issue. Anyway, that's kind of a 301 <laughs> talk. And and uh, AdPub, they, they ran into that with uh, cash flow and they started giving big advances and then they started drawing back from those advances because they weren't earning the money back for a longer and longer period of time. And being cash poor means you're going to be product poor. And uh, if you're if you're selling products to the customers, there's a certain amount of new product that you need. And this is something understanding with your with your advertising is. A new product helps immensely. And Mark Dawson commented on this a couple months ago. He had that new release and he said, my advertising cost went down to 10% and it was my biggest month ever because new release. So you need new products, but then you still need to advertise and you can monetize your backlist. 
uh, and keep moving forward, build a bigger foundation. I'm monetizing my backlist and adding readers to my uh, uh, to my newsletter list. And these are readers of my my particular genre. And it's a, it, it's working out and it's increasing my revenue. And I'm writing, I'm actually written a lot of books this year, but my goal was only four to six books this year. Uh, and I'm already at like eight. <clears throat> but that's a that's a completely Stop different. So that's goals. that's a every <laughs> everybody has their COVID. <laughs> everybody has their COVID stories. This is what happens when you make me stay home and I don't get to travel at all. I write more books. Um, <clears throat> so so it's it's so I'm adding product and oh by the way adding readers and and really building. This is a this is a big building year for me, uh, and I've been in this business going on almost five years now. <clears throat> so even even old dogs can learn new tricks. The uh, and paperbacks. I'm finally getting into Ingram Spark. Ingram ah, Spark. Okay. Yes. I think Joseph Alexander something. brought up a good point. He's like, magically, he said, uh, just magically, some somebody bought 900 copies of one of my books. And uh, thank you, Ingram. He's like, hey, if you don't have them on Ingram, especially because they do, they'll distro to everybody. So they are the yeah. uh, the big distributor. And uh, thank. I mean, that nonfiction guitar. Okay, hey, maybe more people are at home trying to learn uh, teach themselves guitar. Great, great for uh, Joe Alexander on on his his series and his niche. He owns that, um, and and great for the potential. And so my uh, my thriller November thirtieth. I'm putting that on uh, on uh, uh, Ingram, right. mm -hmm. Amazon, Amazon for Amazon specific paperback distribution and an Ingram for wide and, and everything else. It'll be, I'm going to go unique to uh, uh, exclusive to Amazon for the ebook because that's my readership and I really want them on board with this thriller series. So uh, I'll, stay, I'll stay with KU, but in Ingram, I'll be uh, elsewhere and embracing the love. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we should actually ask our Ingram contact to jump on. Did you talk to her? During the COVID Robin's issue? retiring. Yeah, Robin is retiring. So, so Josh, I think, will be the Josh Wiley. I think of the new guy. Okay, so that became. See, this is how out of it I am. I, I knew that it was going to happen, but it wasn't mentioned. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was upcoming. I mean, she talked to us about that. I think at last uh, twenty books. Yeah, and uh, and and it, it was. I think that was going to be part of her big swan song was come to 20 books and, and uh, shake hands and, and wish everybody well, introduce Josh. They're both scheduled to come, but uh, no, nobody's coming uh, <clears throat> because all the uh, companies have canceled their company travel for the rest of the year. Almost all podiums coming and they're bringing their president too. So, yeah, I had heard that. So that's, that's, that's cool. And, and great for the people who decide not to come once again, no onus on anything like that. We want everyone to feel and be safe. So, but uh, yep, yeah, yep. and that's what, and, and that's why we started with the mask. The <laughs> cool twenty book. Now, I had this metal strip when it came. It didn't have a. It doesn't have that. But I had this metal strip because we had purchased some other masks, and uh, it's like an attachers, and that helps immensely because it keeps your glasses from fogging because it wraps around your nose. You put your glasses on top of it. And then it keeps that air from going up there and fogging your glasses, which makes it really painful to uh, uh, to wear and be out and about and just constant fog that you're trying to look through. <clears throat> All right. Um, I don't so, think that uh, we, are. we have any other questions, except that you know everybody now realizes that there are people who shade the truth, people who outright lie, statisticians, and crypto people in the military. They're the top <laughs> PR. PR is military in there, sorry, intelligence. Underneath statistician. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. PR civil affairs, those guys. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we're here and we don't 99, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, 100. CNM show at 100. So, uh, for 100, we'll have some giveaways. We'll think about what the, what those will be for people who listen live. Maybe you have folks later and, uh, we'll, we'll send some stuff out, some personally signed stuff. Uh, I've got my, uh, uh, maybe get a, an LMBPN hat from the big guy himself. We um we I was told recently that this is one of the nicest hats you can own, and they should be at thirty effing dollars a piece, <laughs> possibly ever. If it if it's nice, I like mine. I like my my silver one. It uh, it sits on there nice and 
considering shaving my head because of this, they put wax in my hair for my uh, sleep study. They like yeah. wax globules and then taped <laughs> it on. So I had wax and tape on my head because I put all these electrodes on my, my head. It was really weird. And I'm like, you should have told me I would have just shaved it then as opposed to trying to get this wax out of my, out of my freaking little baby hairs up here. <clears throat> so, I, I didn't have anyway. a problem. Just saying. <laughs> this is, and so here we'll we go are. with this. Yesterday morning, I wake up and I'm waking up really early now that we've moved. And I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking about the different things that are going on during the day. And I'm like, I wonder how Craig is. You know, I know that he's slept this whole night and he's been having these sleeping issues. So I'm like, you know, I should probably talk to him, but he's probably not actually awake and or through his process. So I'll talk to him later. I'll, I'll spend a couple hours and then I'll get a hold of him. And uh, so I squirreled after that. I, I got onto all sorts of other stuff and totally forgot that Craig was going through this medical stuff. Now I get this message about, about three or four o'clock yesterday afternoon. Hey man, everything went good with the medicine. And you could, he, he, I'm surprised you didn't hear me in Alaska. No, I forgot shit. <laughs> so I get on the phone and call him. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. What? It's all good. We get busy. I mean, you're, 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 you're busy. I, I'm busy for Pete's sake and I'm, I'm nobody. So uh, we're, we're here. Episode 99. You just saw it. We have episode 100 coming up. How about that? 100 episodes. Yes, we did them uh, daily through the the pandemic, the initial part, the lockdown, especially to give some give people a, a distraction from the everyday uh, challenges of uh, their new lives, based on uh, everybody being locked down. Hey, you have to stay in your house. Uh, go order your and groceries by, and online. By, and by we, you meant you. You're the one who did all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we interviewed a lot of people from uh, 20 Books Vegas who were on the guest list. <clears throat> we will follow up with some interviews as we get closer to the show because a number of people have pulled out. But we are going to virtually pipe them into the show like uh, 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 David Farland, uh, John Truby, and, and some exceptional guests that we had lined up to uh, provide information that's very that's very unique to them that, because they are experts in their industry and in their niche of the industry. So, uh, but otherwise it'll be an in-person show. We'll talk to everybody who's there. And we know right now Vegas is only allows groups of 50 people, but we expect that to change. And I've been in touch with the hotel. If, uh, if it's still only groups of 50, well, we have five conference rooms. So 250 people will get to enjoy 20 books Vegas with us. And we'll just rotate between rooms and everybody will, uh, will do what they can do. And, uh, but we don't expect that. We expect we'll have, uh, 500 or so at the show and we'll just uh, make it work um and and that it will be open for that if it's not then i will give refunds uh, and uh, that's outside of the refund I'll, I'll, you're not going to just lose your money because you had faith that we're going to have a show uh, don't worry about that we'll either roll you over give you a refund whatever you need to do and uh, and uh, uh uh touchless hugs touchless handshakes uh, greetings <clears throat> uh all, all of that good stuff it's it's be great, man. It's by Bond. It's bond. Vegas. You can't miss. You can't all miss. Right. All right. Uh, thank you for listening in, everybody. Uh, Take care. You everyone. guys all have a great day, and we'll see you next. Bye.